Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Barry Rosen about reimagining onboarding to attract and retain top talent. Barry Rosen, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you very much, John. Good to be here. It is a pleasure to be with you today. You're in Berkeley. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about reimagining onboarding to attract and retain top talent. This is a super hot topic. Uh, I think organizations are always struggling with this, but particularly right now, it's, it's particularly a challenge. Uh, so we're going to be exploring not only how the pandemic has impacted this and the current labor market uh, certainly has, is, is highlighting this issue uh, and has made it even more challenging, but we're going to talk about more generally and what we can do about it to make sure that we are getting great people on our team to help us to be successful. As we get started, I wanted to share Barry's bio with everybody. Barry Rosen serves as the Chief Executive Officer of Interaction Associates, a pioneer in creative problem solving, collaborative leadership, and group facilitation. As CEO, Barry's mission is to empower associates to make decisions and provide services that help clients achieve their goals. Barry is the designer and developer of much of Interaction Associates intellectual content, including leadership, teamwork, and facilitated learning programs. Interaction Associates is best known for introducing the concept and practice of group facilitation to the business world in the early 1970s. For over 50 years, IA has provided thousands of leaders and teams with practical, simple, and effective programs, tools, and techniques for leading, meeting, and working better across functions, viewpoints, and geographies. What a tremendous background. It truly is a pleasure to have you. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we go? Oh, that, was, uh, that was really uh, heady. That was very, very good. <laughs> I will say that the, you know, the notion of uh, being more collaborative, building more collaborative, inclusive environments, is just, just really the way that, you know, what we have to be doing. And um, I like to call that collaborative intelligence. We're all, we all have natural ability to collaborate. We've been on the planet 250,000 years. And so we've learned how to do it. But over the last decade or so, and particularly with the pandemic, our circumstances, like the challenges that we face, and the technology has kind of outstripped our interpersonal skills and our just common sense about what we need. People like to be with other people. They like good relationships. So the onboarding process is the time where you really build relationships that people are committed to so they just don't up and walk away the other thing i just think about is that you probably noticed in your listening audience too is like a lot of people would rather text now than talk Mm -hmm. very interesting thing so we want to get people talking a little bit more and do it in ways that don't waste a whole lot of time because people are very interested in productivity too so i'll i'll uh, leave it at that yeah, well, that, that's 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 super interesting. And I appreciate uh, that context. And really, you know, what your organization has been doing for a long time is is tremendous. Uh, and it all starts uh, with a recognition that we are social animals. So you, you already referred to this, but we are yes. social animals. We evolved as social beings. 
Uh, so we need to be able to interact with each other and collaboration is a big piece of that. We're going to find more meaning, fulfillment, and purpose in our work when we connect with and collaborate effectively with those around us. But on the other hand, when we don't communicate well, when we don't collaborate effectively, it actually re can really drive down motivation and productivity and it can be so, so frustrating. Uh, so we need to learn how to do it better, how to do it well. Um, and, and it really starts with getting the right people on the team in the first place. So as we go through the hiring process, you know, that recruitment and selection process, we want to make sure that we're, we're, we have good processes in place to make sure that we're getting good people uh, and then making sure that they are acculturated to the organization, its, vi its vision, its mission, its values, uh, and what makes it tick so that it has a better, so these individuals have a better chance of really getting integrated in to the team. And that's where onboarding comes in, right? Exactly. And you, you put your finger on a lot of things there, which is we're social animals. Uh, we like to connect with each other. And so we're always looking to see who's really good at conversation, who's really good at uh, being more authentic, people who I can trust. And so these are the kinds of things that your onboarding process should include, not just the checklist of items about what people have to know about the company and uh, you know, what their job requirements are, but uh, to actually have the experience of connecting and bonding with others. So we'll probably get to this, but like 40, the, the statistics from the Department of Labor, Labor, 47 million people left their jobs in 2021. I assume it's going to be the same number. This is historical. It's not really um, the great resignation. It's the great reshuffle. People are moving around jobs. So they're not staying, you know, a, a, a big percentage of people within the first six months, like I think it's 30%. Don't stay. Why is that? Well, it's the, why is it? I'll answer my question is that they're not feeling connected with other people yeah. or with the mission of the organization. So your onboarding process is really critical to model you know, what, what you want the, organi the organization's culture. I'll just yeah. leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes back to the onboarding piece, but a lot of that is just, you know, people feeling like, this isn't what I signed up for, you know, like I, I, I uprooted my life, maybe I moved, or at least I, I made a big transition. I'm, I'm now working for this organization. I feel like it, there's a bit of a bait and switch, or, you know, I feel like what I signed up for is not what I'm getting. And right now we know that employees have a lot of leverage, there's lots of opportunities. And so why stick around? They just left something you know, already that they, they, you know, so they're in that headspace of being willing to, to try something new, why stick around and some to something new that's not working. Right. And so I think all of those things just feed into it. Uh, and this gets back to how I introduced the episode for today. I know you wanted to talk about reimagining onboarding and you just mentioned a few minutes ago about like the onboarding checklist. Now are checklists helpful, useful tools. Sure. Is checklist is giving someone a checklist onboarding. I sure hope that's not what you're doing for your onboarding. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's a, it's a starter um, about the kinds of things that we want a new employee to know how, you know, what the mission of the company is, you know, what the latest annual report data is, what some of the, who the client, uh, the customers are, what, how basic work processes work, who's in the, who's who in the company, you know, there are about 20 items or so that you could list and that over the course of the first month, you should get through those. But that's not the point. That's the content. What we're talking here is about the relationship. And how do I learn that and say, John, if you were my new manager, like I'd want to be with you just like this, if I'm if, if we're at a distance. I want to spend time with you and for you to tell me those things, not just to have me read something and for us to talk about the implications of it and for you to find out about my needs and how I like to learn. And, and, and so I really get a sense that you care and the, the trick is that you really do care. <laughs> I hope that you really do care, right? Yeah. And, and people can pick up on that very, very quickly. 
Um, and so did you make the hire? Say I'm the, I'm the boss. I'm the yeah. leader. I just fill a position. This new person's coming in. How I interact with them in those early days is going to speak volumes. Did I just hire this person to be a butt in a seat to fill a hole because I was stressed that I, you know, was without a member of my team for a while. And I just like, I just needed to fill the hole. Um, if that's what you're doing, and if that's the way you're approaching this person, they're going to feel objectified. They're going to feel as though, you know, their own unique talents and skills aren't going to be utilized. They're, they're just not going to feel as connected to what you're trying to do. And of course, in that environment, more people are going to choose to look for something else. People, especially younger people, but everyone really wants to feel that their job has meaning and purpose, that they have the opportunity to be their whole authentic self and bring their best self to, to the work that they do. And when they don't have that, they're going to start looking elsewhere. And we know, for example, that younger millennial and Gen, Gen Z workers in particular, uh, there's been quite a bit of research on this. They, they are not in a headspace where they want to go into a job work their butts off for a couple decades, and then at some point later in their career, do something worthwhile and meaningful and then give back. They want to do something of significance now. Now, some people say that's entitled. I say that's perfectly reasonable. Like, I, that's what I would want. Uh, I don't know why we feel like it's entitled that our employees want to do something that matters and they want to be coached and they want to be guided and they want to be developed. That That's good leadership. And so we need to just focus on that more and provide that. And it all starts with that onboarding. So as you mentioned, you know, as we reimagine it, get getting beyond checklists is the very first thing, right? Like hopefully we're not just doing checklists, getting beyond that, making sure we're, we're uh, interacting with people in the way that we would want to be interacted with and the way that they need to be interacted with in order to feel connected and engaged. That is the, the foundational starting point, I think. I know. I love what you're saying. And so if we were going to give some advice, say, to people who are responsible for onboarding and for the new manager or the, your new manager, and two words come to me, and I think you sh shared one of them, which was purpose. Like, what's the purpose of this organization and why is it meaningful to me? And how might it be meaningful to you? And how can you realize some of your career aspirations in helping me as your manager and your team forward that mission? So I feel like I'm important. That's, that's really, so I'm important. This is meaningful. The second one is empathy. That, um, you know, leading with purpose and empathy. And empathy kind of, kind of takes various, various levels to that. The first one is, I, I get that you get where I'm coming from. You understand me and you have an appreciation of my situation. Like I'm 27 years old. I've been in two jobs. I really liked, you know, if it's not a lifer, maybe seven years, you know, I'd want to be in this organization. I don't want to leave after a, a year and a half, which is a lot of the, the statistics is people lasting a year and a half and coming into new jobs. And I know in our company, unless the person is like between 20 and 25 years old and might be a three year stint, the next level we're going for is seven years and then lifer, because that's where, you know, you're really getting, you're leveraging a person's talent and their commitment. So if, if you want to have a person stay with you, that aside from purpose is empathy, understanding uh, where they're coming from, having an appreciation of it and, uh, real compassionate empathy is taking actions that have the new employee know you actually care about their development and they're fitting in. So finding out specifically what is it that you want to learn, you know, who do you want to be connected with, et cetera, and coming up with a specific action plan for them to realize their aspirations. And that, can, that has the new employee say, this person's for real. It's not BS. They're, they really mean what they say. They're walking their talk. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's really what we, we have to help to come across that we are for real, that we really do care that we are invested in them. They need to feel invested in. And if not, you know, they're, they're going to walk, they're going to go other places um, or perhaps even worse than them leaving and going somewhere else is they're just going to mentally check out and say, well, okay, I'm just going to kind of just come here, do the bare minimum spend half my day looking for other jobs, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. That's not helpful either. 
Well, I think getting back to the, you know, the, the people who are responsible for onboarding and oftentimes it's the HR group who really have to team up with the manager. It's a shared responsibility along with the new employee. And I, um, so it's this is getting back to this is a collaborative effort and we're all going to take responsibility for different parts of this effort so that after three months you go this is the place that i really want to be i really like my manager i like the mission of the company there's an opportunity for growth i feel like i can make a contribution and a great way to start that is with a cohort of other new employees and who are going through the same process, which, which has markers along the way that you can celebrate and get a sense of, yeah, I really accomplished that. And I've met other people in the company that are also newbies and we're all going through this together and our managers are all involved and the HR people are there for support. It's a real team effort. That's how we work here. We work in teams. You know, people who are under 30, like my son said to me, oh, you know, I've been working in teams since I was in kindergarten. You don't have a lot to teach me about collaboration. Of course, he's got a lot to learn, but that's true. Younger people have learned to work in teams. So demonstrate an effective team learning process for the onboarding. Here are the 10 things that we want everybody to learn. And here's who's going to help you learn. And we want you to work together to learn those things. So we're in it together. I'm not, I'm not by myself. Yeah, so so there might be a few people of the say the group of 30 that are coming in this month or you know within the next three months that five of them may wash out or just quit, but that your statistics about who stays really go up. And if you can do those things, demonstrate that as a manager that you really care, connect them with the mission, connect them with the new cohort, connect them with their team and talk about you know why are we doing this why is it important to me and that last thing along the way is demonstrate effective uh i would say um accomplishment recognize accomplishment not like always oh, showed up at work let's reward him but real things how people supported me in moving along the way and so then you're also creating a kind of a culture of appreciation and we like yeah. that. Every human being needs a, a dose of it every day. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like that culture of appreciation, never suppressing a kind thought, making sure that, you know, you're, you're coaching people, which means sometimes there's constructive feedback um, involved. And, and people, especially early on, they want to know what they're doing. They want to know what they should be doing. They want to know if they're not going the right direction. Um, so, so coach them, mentor them guide them, give that feedback, but also be healthy with, you know, with the praise uh, and, and show the gratitude. And when you see them doing something well, let them know it. And, and, you know, don't just assume that it's all, you know, don't take it for granted that they will understand that you, you appreciate what they're doing. I, uh, I think it's especially for new people. Um, and I suppose it depends on personality type, but most new people are craving that. And especially there's certain personality types where they just need it because they're constantly so hard on themselves that unless they're getting it, they're going to feel like they're not doing well. Yes, that's, that's great. And then that, um, and that word feedback, of course, you know, when people think about feedback it means I screwed up and somebody's going to tell me, you know, that how I screwed up. Um, and for a lot of people, most feedback is I've got, a pro I wanted to give you some feedback, which is essentially I've got my, a problem and my problem is you. So I want to just I want to tell you about it uh, as distinct from that thinking about feedback is really a form of love. It's a it's a way to help somebody improve. So getting good at for managers, getting good at feedback, which is, you know, this was the expectation. This was the behavior. This was the impact. And here's something you can do differently. Or if it's affirmative feedback, this was. The, the behavior this was the impact and i really appreciate it because you know that's really making a difference for our team so uh not a lot of no fluff around the sides just get really good at giving both affirmative and uh i call it reconstructive feedback
and you've already mentioned, I mean, some of the types of things we should be doing as we're reimagining and reframing this whole idea of onboarding, um, you know, orientations and, and those sorts of things helpful. Yes. If that's what onboarding means and that's all it is, you're probably missing out and you're not going far enough. Um, you, you talked about uh, collaborative sessions, you know, as you're going through that onboarding to, to demonstrate like what is effective teamwork in our team. Uh, that's a good spot where you can reinforce the values of your team uh, and, you know, what it means to create a psychologically safe environment, for example, for people to provide input, to challenge each other, um, those sorts of things. Like you can say that all day long, but until people actually start to see it, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be hard for that to really click and to stick with them and to even believe it, you know, because you may, they may think, well, yeah, of course they're saying that, but in practice, they're going to be reserved and careful until they have evidence that that's actually what you want and how you're going to be rewarding people and or punishing people based on how they engage with each other. So, so looking for those opportunities for kind of a, a collaborative team-based approach to your onboarding, I think is, is really great. Uh, I know one thing you talk about is cohort learning, why it's important in onboarding. And I'm wondering if you could tell us just a little bit more about that and how we might set that up. Well, co- cohort learning is really good. You would bring people together, focused on a, just a single subject. Uh, it could be around personnel policies, or it could be around, a, you know, a part of the core business process, whatever it is. And they're coming together, and um, it allows the opportunity for the manager to connect with them around something that's important for their work, to to learn with them. Uh, to help them teach each other, to have some, you know, uh, of what clear learning outcomes are going to be. The the opportunity for that is not just for collaboration. So like we're all getting through this together, but for reflection and uh, providing in, in, in a learning environment, the importance of slowing down and reflecting. Uh, it also builds, helps build skill, listening skills what we call listening as an ally, when you're really teaming up with someone so that they really understand something and take action on it. Um, and it and, and you can also attach that cohort learning with the practical outcome. Uh, for example, it could be some process improvement for the team. So by the end of the learning experience, which might be two weeks long, say, two one hour sessions plus some interim work that the teams do that they come out with a set of uh, recommendations that would go if it's in uh, during the course of the onboarding process which would go to hr for them to consider you know for future onboarding so that they really feel like they're contributing to the improvement of a critical business process so cohort learning is great for that, as opposed to just sending one person off or two people and coming back and recommending, which really puts a lot of pressure on the individuals to perform in this way. Cohort learning raises the, uh, the importance of learning to the importance of the task that they're doing and begins to say we are a learning culture as well. We're an inclusive, collaborative learning culture, which is just what I wanted when I was six years old. You know, and and I'm getting it now when I'm 30 or 35. Yeah, I I think that's great. That's something that I think more organizations can really try out and experiment with. Uh, I I haven't seen that in in many organizations, though I have seen it at times and and I've experienced it to be very effective as well. Um, I'm wondering what else you think in terms of like the types of skills um, that talent managers and company leaders Uh, should be looking to develop, like actively pursuing to develop in themselves and foster within their, uh, within their teams, uh, if they hope, you know, to really retain and engage new team members uh, more effectively, and to help them to have more meaningful experiences out of the gate. So as we think about this ongoing onboarding process, the goal is you're going to be able to retain good people. Um, What, what other skills that we need to be developing so we can do that better? I think the for the manager as uh, it's like leader as coach kind of skills that they have developed some coaching and teaching skills. So for a manager to be able to do a single point lesson, for example, themselves, 25 minutes, what we're going to be talking about 
is uh, the way we make decisions around here. I wanna talk about the levels of decision-making that I think about as a leader and how I go about making decisions. And now let's talk about that. It's a 25 minute session. So you have to you know, develop your skills of, of around teaching basic things, managers, teacher, and then coaching people around those, um, around those things. Then of course, there's your basic collaboration skills, how to build understanding and agreement so people can take informed, concerted action. There are ways to, you know, people have needs, one of the main ways they meet their needs is collaborating. There are better and worse ways to collaborate. You can learn the better ways to collaborate. And so, you know, uh, come up with that list of, you know, seven or eight collaboration skills and systematically build the language of collaboration with your, with your uh, new team and present that. I mean, once you have it, it's like your organizational mission values are I hear, what about our operating agreements about how we collaborate with each other in order to get work done? And those are like mantras, you, you know, you bring them out a lot and that sets the expectation that we're gonna learn. We're gonna learn how to uh, inquire before we advocate. You know, we're gonna learn to look for the win-win. We're gonna learn how to do those things. So I would say that uh, coaching, teaching, collaboration skills, and of course at the root, is your listening skills. So all, all managers should be fantastic that. advice. Yeah. Barry, this has just been a super fun conversation. And I note the time it has just flown by. Uh, we're almost to the end of our time together. But before we wrap up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, find out more about your team, and then give us the final word on the topic for today on how we can reimagine our onboarding processes. Okay, well, very good. The, the organization is Interaction Associates, also known as IA. Our mission is to help people work better together. So not only do they achieve their practical results, but it also enables them to realize their more noble aspirations. That's what we want to have as workers. So that's what our mission is. And we teach uh, collaborative leadership, group facilitation. And by that, I mean task-focused problem-solving. Uh, we have a lot of programs on uh, inclusion, on strategic thinking, et cetera, both short courses, long courses, in person, online. Um, you can get uh, to us by simply looking at our at our website, interactionassociates.com, and uh, you, connect, you can connect with someone there. Uh, our mission is to help you work better with your team, so we're, we want to find the best solutions for you, even if it's not with us. Um, getting back to um, um, the, uh, the topic of today, uh, I would say I'll leave you with the, the idea that the onboarding process is a collaborative process that requires shared responsibility between HR, the manager, and the employee. You're a team that's going to help someone move through this process their first three months, and at the end of it, they're going to go, this is the place that I want to be. And for those that don't want to be there, you don't want them there anyway. But that first three months marker, you should really be able to tell whether that you want that employee to stay and then just really take care of them in their learning process because people want to learn. They want to be included. They want to work with others. So create processes that enable those kinds of needs to be met. Yeah, well said. And it's a shared process just to reiterate what you're talking about. So many great insights. Great wisdom, Barry. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your, your experience and your insights with me and my listeners. Uh, I encourage listeners to reach out to get connected, find out more about what Barry and his team can do for you. As always, I hope you can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. Hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.